Today is going to be the last uh, formal lab. Uh, from following Friday, we'll actually make this an office hour. And so I asked Pierre to come by. He's the other TA uh, specifically for technology. He's really cool. He, we worked together in 147 last quarter. Um, so he knows a lot of stuff. So uh, it's cool to have him. And we'll just basically be here as well. So if you have any technology questions. Um, and given that it's the last Friday, I do have goodies, but the problem is you have to answer a question and be the first one to answer it as quickly as possible. So uh, let's make it easy to begin with. And I will toss this in your general direction, but probably, well, I'll try not to hit you. So duck. <laughs> really? Maron? Do you think with all the practice that you can... Aim well? Okay. Uh, first question, what does AJAX stand for? First one is... Okay, awesome. There we go. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, here, some other are a little more obscure. Who was it? Oh, and I'm going to... You could use Wikipedia, but the whole premise is not to use Wikipedia. Um, who coined the term AJAX? Any, any idea who coined it? Mm, okay. Uh, not quite. Uh, someone uh, who is actually a UX designer. Um, his name is Jesse Garrett. And uh, he was actually looking at Google Maps and Google, what was called suggest at that point. When you type in words, it would suggest mm -hmm. what you would be searching for. Uh, and he said, oh, that's kind of asynchronous. It's JavaScript. And at the, point, at the time, he suggested, he thought that you know, there was a, a lot of XML involved. Uh, OK, well, there's a lot of stuff left. So. Um, <laughs> OK, so there are, we talked about jQuery in this uh, class. Um, what are the, some of the, name two other frameworks, aside from jQuery, that you could use to do AJAX? One are you fine? Mm, OK, that's, that's one. Cool. You need two. <laughs> Pierre, you're out of this. <laughs> and if you want, Arnie, something. Well, you could answer, but well, does, does Moo Tools work? That, that would be one of the other ones. There's Moo Tools, there's ext.js, ex, xjs. Um, there's Prototype, which you might be familiar with. Uh, and there's something called Dojo, which apparently has been around for quite a while now. Uh, hmm. What are the differences between those? Uh, basic syntax is the idea. Um, you could do, so the the first premise of AJAX, of jQuery and a lot of frameworks is to abstract out the what you might be familiar with, like document element dot get id get by id. You know that syntax is just annoying to replicate each and every time. So each language has their own approach to simplifying that. Um, MooTools came out initially with this sort of approach to making really cool interactions, specifically not as a be all and end all for AJAX. Um, so uh, like accordion menu uh, expansion was one of their biggest things back in the day. Um, so yeah, each one of them has a little bit of something. Uh, another trivia question. What was JavaScript? It used to be known by another name. Mm, not quite. Ah, I, I can't give you more <laughs> Yeah, you're correct. It's ECMAScript. What's interesting is that JavaScript was started as a European standard. Um, and so the European Computer Manufacturers Association is called ECMA, and they're the ones that first underlyingly set up the, the uh, syntax for JavaScript. Mm. Is it something distinct from? Like, is ECMAScript, if you, if you refer to ECMAScript, mm. ECMAScript, is, that, is that synonymous with JavaScript? Yes, right now it is synonymous. The W3C <laughs> calls it the same thing right now. Um, uh, OK, so here's another one. Uh, there's a less intense version of AJAX uh, that is not that doesn't do AJAX basically, uh, but it involves a, all all sorts of the interactions that you could typically do on a page. And it was very popular in the mid '90s, early 2000s. What was it called? It's also an acronym, by the way, and it has HTML in it. <laughs> It is the HTML. It's dynamic HTML. And the difference between dynamic HTML and AJAX is that dynamic was basically modifying everything you can see, but not having the interactions with the back end, for example. Mm. 
Uh, how were the interactions with the back end handled before? Um, you would do, so the, this, there wasn't really a standard that let you use it, um, but uh, there was a, a, a thing where you could actually make an HTTP request using uh, JavaScript. So that's basically the, the premise of Ajax. Uh, but if you bake it into JavaScript, you've got uh, the more convenient uses of it. Uh, hmm. mm. uh, okay, so I guess, um, when was jQuery first, in, first invented? <laughs> you can throw out numbers, that's good, I figured. 2006. Oh, hey, okay, what did that do? Good stuff. Awesome. Um, I'll try to think of other questions as we go along. Actually, there are some questions in the presentation, so I'll go quickly over some of the stuff that I want to cover, uh, just because we wanted to make sure that Ajax is uh, deeply covered so that you're familiar with it. My goal, um, oh, some of the things you'll need today to follow along, um, a PHP my admin, uh, so if you could pull that up, that way we can uh, follow along. I've pretty much set up all the SQL files that you can import really easily. Uh, Firebug or Chrome is going to be our best buddy uh, for this time around, if you're not familiar with Ajax already. And some editor of some kind, text editor, uh, or Vim, Vim or Emacs. My goal for today is for you to be able to look at any Ajax script out there. Uh, there's a bunch that I'll go through, but there's always more than I can cover. And my goal is to make sure that you can look at it and say, hmm, I can sort of imagine what's going on, how it happens, how it works maybe deconstruct it a little bit. If I saw the code, I might be able to understand what's going on. So that's my goal. Uh, we're going to be covering a little bit of Ajax. Uh, we'll be developing those two apps that I talked about. And uh, yeah, that's, that's basically what we're doing. The first thing I want to clarify is that jQuery is not Ajax. I've heard that sort of overlapping uh, quite a few times, actually, during office hours, for example. And based the 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 underlying theme that I want to highlight is Ajax is a way to get you know, data and communi communicate. jQuery is just a method or the tool that is appropriate for, for doing that very easily that we suggested, but that MooTools or EXEJS or Prototype are equally good systems that let you uh, harness Ajax. Or you could write your own uh, you know, system to, to, to do exactly the same functions. So you might have seen this before. Uh, basically, this is the old model, um, and I actually have a different version of this drawing later on. What we're trying to do is bypass the whole process of actually going back, doing the round trip between data, tra data transmission and coming back. Some cool demos, actually. So I, uh, last time when we covered Ajax, it was sort of like, oh, this is cool, but it didn't give some context to it. So I figured I'd come up with some uh, examples that you might actually be already familiar with. So if you're providing rating examples, um, you, you typically have a system where you can rate a quote, a comment, or even a restaurant you know, with a particular number of stars. And if you clicked on that and it brought you to a separate page, you sort of lose the user flow. So a lot of Ajax is, is done uh, behind the scenes on this one. This one's pretty cool. Um, and some of these demos uh, actually don't really work well in a mobile sense, and that's why I've actually skipped over it. But I think the reason why you're all here is because you want to understand Ajax in a greater context. And Ajax's use in a mobile sense is fairly limited. So if you take a look at some of the demos where in which your browser can take advantage of Ajax, things like inline editing, um, so if you double click and you can say hello um, and be able to save things, uh, is pretty neat. right? And you would be able to harness this very much in a mobile, uh, in a browser sense, you could take advantage of it in a mobile sense as well. But the whole idea of you know double tapping to edit is still a very fairly new modality. Um, some other things, uh, file uploading. Uh, one of the concerns I had with some of the projects that was coming out of 147 is that people were assumed that you can actually upload a file using your browser in uh, your iPhone, in your mobile phone. And unfortunately, that is not the case, simply because of the way the iPhone is structured. But uh, what's nice about when you take this off the mobile phone and start looking at uploading files, you can do everything pretty much in a uh, you know one-spot fashion where if you uh, upload a file, you don't have to 
you know, you can take advantage of the actual transmission of data without refreshing the page. And you might have seen this before. Uh, maybe a lot of simple enroll, for example, uh, uses Ajax as well in a very similar fashion. You don't necessarily upload files, but it's the same sort of premise. Uh, Autocomplete. Uh, this may be something, uh, this will be something we'll cover um, in the code. Um, and what's, uh, what's, you know, it's convenient to be able to have a, a fixed set of data that a user can enter based on a data set that you have in the back end. Uh, a rather random one that came up was uh, that you can actually do face detection using Ajax. Um, I'm not very familiar as to how accurate this is, um, but if you'd like to take a look, if you just do jQuery face detection, um, the, the idea is that it can generally get a box around uh, what it deems to be the eyes and the face and the nose in general. So it's, it's pretty neat, you know, it's pushing the boundaries of, of uh, what can be done in Ajax. And uh, the cool thing is that because you harness jQuery, your method for calling that is just one line. Um, and so we actually did talk about how we were to do Ajax last time, the sort of overlying uh, methodologies that you want to connect to the data database, right? You want to use some method to do that, you just typically using PHP. You want to display data and you also want to send data and manipulate that data. Um, so here's another trivia question. What were the two types of requests that one can make to get Ajax rolling? This was covered previously. Yes. I think you were fastest. So. <laughs> Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think, yeah. You get in post correct. Um, sorry, that was poorly aimed. Um, but yes, the, uh, the approach that you can get uh, data is using P uh, get and post, and this is a sort of rough drawing of how things were without Ajax, or are without Ajax. Basically what you're doing is that you have an existing HTML or PHP page, you make a get or post request using a form to a PHP file that handles things with a database. Now, uh, but behind this sort of simple diagram is actually something that I'm going to actually take a tangent to. How, how many of you are familiar with MVC? Or have heard of MVC, maybe? Do you know what it is or what it sort of uh, encapsulates? Yeah, it's like a structure for, kind of, it's a design pattern, I mm -hmm. think is the idea. So like model view controller, so model is like, is the structure of how your data is represented. Yep. View is basically the UI and the controller, sort of some sort of uh, module between that's correct. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Um, and in a sense, there are, so there are frameworks out there like Cake PHP that really encap, um, sort of encodes the model view controller explicitly. But I like to imagine that we can even adopt that same design pattern in uh, this particular approach that we have right here, where the view is what you see, what the, the user sees in the browser. The, the uh, controller is the PHP file handling the interactions between the database and the front end. And the database is the model that encapsulates the idea. So it's not a particularly daunting approach. Um, it, when you hear about MVC and learn about it more, um, you may have just recognized that you actually do those exact practices, but not as explicitly. Um, so when we modify things uh, back in, so the top one is sort of back in the day, uh, when we do Ajax, we're not actually re reading a new page, we're creating a callback to the initial JavaScript file um, through PHP. So PHP is displaying data, JavaScript is saying, give me that data, okay, now what do I do with it? And this might appear a little uh, obtuse right now, so um, we'll, we'll take the deep dive into code very shortly. Um, so another quick question. Uh, what are the two ways we can display Ajax responses? This was also covered in a previous lecture. So Ajax can... The response here is put in quotation marks because um, it's an id... it's not... one of the hints is that it's not always legitimate. Um, 
Mm, not quite. Um, I was thinking more of a higher level approach of like, uh, there are two ways in which you can display data using Ajax um, when it comes back, or if it comes back. Are ways of encoding it? Like JSON, JSON? Uh, so maybe not as explicitly, and maybe the question was phrased incorrectly, but the idea was that I was trying to get to was that you could either make it or fake it. Right, you could make the actual query to the database and have the database come back with legitimate information that says, okay, I submitted and saved your data. Or you could fake it and say, actually, I'm going to send that data. Don't care about what's coming back. I'm just going to give the impression that it worked. Now, what are the diff why would one do one over another? What's the difference? You need something to be fast, <laughs> but not necessarily. 100% accurate and handling all the errors yep. that could happen? That's correct, yeah. Um, yeah, you, you can give the impression that you're actually making something a lot faster by faking it. And actually, it, you know, once you refresh the page, that whether or not that data, data appears can be, uh, can be really encoded. But it's, it's a very, generally a very pretty poor practice to do that. So, okay, so without further ado, let's actually make it. Um, the link below here, so j.mp forward slash 147 lecture 6 should actually bring you to a Google Doc into which I will paste code from which you can copy into your own code so you could follow along. Uh, last time I sort of tried to do that but it didn't work as well uh, so if you could go to that link right now. We're going to uh, first of all uh, a, well let's first of all check out code shall we? Uh, so uh, let's go. I'm just going to go to the same thing, and I'm going to paste in what I'm going to do. Uh, sev um, oops. Um, mm, is it double dash username? Uh, is okay. Um, test, and we're going to check it out from my repository. So um, um, lecture six. So if you run this, let me just run this exact same code. Mm. Mm, ah. uh, ooh, SVN Co. That would be it. Check out. Mm. Why did it? Uh, a little bit of a hiccup there. Let me just check that that actually does exist. Mm, um, mm, sorry about that. Uh, is it, did I put it in correct? Um, me, uh, I think. Could have something. Wrong. Oh, uh, where could it be? Ah, I see. Uh, did I get that wrong? Six. Yes, that would be it. So, sorry, poor populate the preparation on my part. So, and the username password should be test. So this is the correct syntax. I apologize for that hiccup right there. So test, test. And let's make sure everyone has these files. There's some extra files that you don't really need here, but that should be fine. And I'm actually going to take the uh, GUI approach here, uh, just because it's a little easier to see. Um, and so if you go, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually implement this, this movie approach. And uh, the, once again, the movie, what the movie does is it has a database full of sort of movie selections. Uh, with a title and an image URL. And what happens in the interaction is that when I click on something, it gets saved, saved to the database. The database says, I have 
I have registered um, a click and so actually let's take a look at what it looks like from the database perspective um, and this is something you will uh, you will also replicate on your end but once you click something basically hey, um, oops, wrong one sorry I'm referring to a different uh, database could it be yes um, uh, sorry I'm actually referring using a different database so I apologize for this um, actually. Mm -hmm. do, do, do. Hard to remember passwords sometimes. So the idea is that when you click on something, uh, the database registers that as uh, a save, uh, you know, a clicked event. And what you do then is from the view side, you're basically requesting information for whatever is new. So some um, some groups have thought of uh, coming up with a way to display multiple on multiple browsers the same exact information like for example if you're all in a meeting how would you display um, the same you know information about the meeting that one person can moderate and then multiple people can see as well it's exactly the same approach um, so the database consists of a, a variety of things um, one of which is basically what is the current saved item, which I've called flicked. Uh, flicked as in, you know, I've saved, I flicked it to the TV or I flicked it to the database, and then I can retrieve at a later point. So it, to, to make this a little clear, if I were to clear everything, right, the database should reflect that there's absolutely nothing as well. If I click on something here, let's say I clicked on robot chicken again, if you refresh the database, that exact same data gets reflected there. Right, so that's the, the one path, one way to the database. The other approach that we're taking from the view side is that we're actually retrieving, uh, so if we go back to the, the actual index.html, we're making a call to the database and saying, what kinds of information do you have? Now, the approach that I have right here is a little uh, less than ideal, and it really harkens back to the chat application that you might have uh, taken a look at in, uh, in the previous lecture where we're always asking the database for new data. The reason you can actually explore that is if you take a look at Firebug and, and, and Chrome does it as well but Firebug is a little more explicit. If you take a look at the kinds of requests that are being done to the database we're actually making a request pretty much every second to see what kinds of data do you have. And this this particular one is always returning the same exact data. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so the question, um, the question is whether or not we want to use a class approach. And, and feel free to interject if I get something wrong, Pierre. But um, the class approach, I think, is only a convenience for accessing the data rather than storing the data. What um, is the class So what you can do is you can create um, functions and classes that encapsulate the data that comes back and access it using methods. Um, which is convenient, and yeah, um, that, that's always like I think one of the best ways to do it. You can mm. stick like a method on on each object that like retrieves any relevant entries in the database, and then mm. update the object as it's defined in it. Yeah, so. definitely. Yep, yep. That's that's a, definitely a smarter approach. Um, right now, a lot of these may appear as toy examples, but I think the round trip is is key. And if if you know what the round trip is, then implementing uh, the, the classes as convenience is just an additional step, right? Um, so that, no, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, so let's actually go through and, and, and implement this one by one. 
Um, the first thing that I uh, would always require is having a way to actually access the database. So um, let's modify config.php, which you should have um, in, your in your folder, to reflect the data that is uh, uh, synonymous to your database. Um, so this should be, typically if you're enrolled in this class, it will be uh, the, um, the host name. And all of this data is also located right here. Uh, so actually, I'm incorrect. Sorry, it's mysql.cs147.org. And your database name is going to be that. And your password, obviously. And your database, oh, your database user actually is your user. Apologize. And your database name is db database. So that should be pretty much as it is. If you were following all along verbatim, you can actually copy what I have right there, but that would just access my database database and it'd be fairly boring if it if you were just using mine. Awesome. So we have some way to access data, um, at least a skeleton of that. What we now need is the tables. And in as far as trying to store the movies, um, I've actually created a SQL file that contains everything that you should need. It's called movies.sql. And if you actually take a look at it, basically what it does is it has all the instructions for creating the table, which is a convenience and it's a nice uh, use for if you're trying to think of portability for your application. Right? If you are creating everything on your database, that's great and that's, that's nice and fine. But if someone else were to come in a year from now and say, hmm, I have no access to that database, but I know how to create that database, then it saves them a lot of work. A lot of times you'll actually end up trying to re reverse engineer a database, and it's a lot of hell because you're like, oh, it's, you know, there's, a, there's a caps where there shouldn't be and, and stuff like that. And then the rest is pretty much... Uh, uh, Netflix data that I scraped yesterday. Um, it basically, uh, if you remember, um, or if you looked at my Facebook API or Facebook integration video, I talked about OAuth. Um, Netflix has a similar approach for their data, which they call OData, uh, so open data, and they give you access to basically the latest movies that people have rated um, uh, and the highest rated, one, rated ones, for example. And so if you're using actually your command line, you could do, uh, uh, if you do MySQL, um, uh, I don't know, how, actually as a poll, how many of you are using the terminal right now? Okay, cool. So the instruction, and I'll paste this in as well once I get it to work, is you put in the, uh, the host, which is what you exactly copied and pasted uh, or into the config.php. So dot host, your username is your username. The sort of odd idiosyncrasy is that the password, because it's space sensitive, will actually have to be immediately after the hyphen P. And so we're basically opening a request to uh, mysql.cs, uh, my you know, the same sort of credentials there. Um, one of the things I'm unsure of, so the, the, the straight and direct approach to import SQL data is to use source. But unfortunately, I do realize that I'm actually in a folder that doesn't contain the source file itself. So I'm going to try this, but I can't guarantee that it's actually going to work. Um, it's actually going to be, I am currently in test. So if I do lecture 6 bear movies.sql. Ah, so uh, you actually have to select the database first. So if you, I think if you do databases, uh, ah, yes, yep, thank you. Uh, is there a plural to that? Yes, okay. So, you, so what you do is you say, I want to use uh, the particular database corresponding to the one that I have. And if you do source uh, and the path to your SQL file, what it'll do is import all the data, so there are 500 rows, and it'll tell you that there, if there are any errors uh, associated with the structure of that data. 
So this is pretty much what you should see. Um, so let me actually copy that into the code. Um, so the first approach was um, do, do, do. Um, once again, if you do this, you're actually accessing your database as me. So put in your and then password. Ah. And once you have that, um, if you actually do uh, show tables, oops, oops, uh, tables, uh, you should see movies right there. Mm -hmm. So if you describe movies, you can actually see all the kinds of data that is uh, contained within that database, right? So if you do select queries, I don't know how many of you are in the or have taken 145, but if you do a simple query like this, you get all the data, right? Uh, and you can do all sorts of neat manipulations with that, which are which are going to come in handy later when we're trying to trying to do uh, the AJAX uh, search. Yep. I'm curious, like, how costly is it to ping the database when you're designing your site? Like, like if you're if you're trying to think about optimizing it, mm -hmm. like, is it really significant to minimize the amount of times you connect the database back and forth? Um, not really. Okay. Uh, so it's because I know that fetching, like, accessing it inside the database, like once you're there, it's mm. not optimized. But I was curious of connecting to it. So oh, that's a good point. What do you think, Pierre? No. Yeah, the best practice is always suggest that, as you say, you open a connection to a database, you do whatever you need to do within it, which is perfectly fine. Um, but you, I would suggest that you wouldn't want to necessarily always open connections, you know, uh, left and right. Okay. Mm. What the cool thing is that when you are doing operations, you can actually see the kinds of operations that are happening happening on that database. So, for example, when I'm actually um, uh, actually let's take a look at um, if you click on home. Andrea, yes. How do you do select the database? Um, you uh, you you could do select all from movies. Oh no. What does it say? Um, it's scale to open. Oh, yeah, that's likely because uh, your actually movies.sql file is somewhere else than you expect it to be. Um, if it's in the if you are in the folder that has everything, then you just need uh, source movies.sql. If it's in a folder that's underneath what you where you are, you want to make sure that um, you refer to that correctly. No. Hmm. Ah, so okay, so the first step before that actually was to create a use a function called use. So use may use des describes what database you want to use. So if we do things in order here, this is going to be your database name. Oops, sorry. Awesome. So one of the side tools about the niceties about PHP my admin is you can actually see the processes that are happening on that database. So if you multi, if you open multiple connections, if you're doing long processes, you'll see that they actually uh, command a certain amount of time. Uh, so when I was actually parsing tweets uh, using PHP my, uh, MySQL, uh, you would have a, a massive memory use here. All right. So moving right along. Uh, the next part we would want to investigate is actually uh, integrating the um, the display of data, right? So we want to actually see all the movies that we just imported. Uh, so let's take a look at um, let's take a look at index.php. It's actually a pretty interesting. Uh, I, I tried to spend a little time uh, optimizing and seeing what we could do with the least amount of stuff so that you can pile things on top of it to make it more useful. And obviously there's absolutely nothing right here. The approach that I'm going to be taking here is that I'm going to be um, actually so the index.php here refers to the file that is retrieving data from movies. right? Whatever movies that you have saved are going to be displayed in index.php. 
that is separate from a file that I've created called the planner, which is a, the file that you do, do all your planning in. Right? So this is actually not index.php, it's the planner.php. So all the interactions that happen on here once you load are separate from index.php. And that distinction... Hmm? Um, not much of a difference uh, in this case. Um, let me just check to see. Yeah, there's actually no need for it to be a PHP file. So you could be running PHP code um, in the HTTP to make it work with the same PHP file. Uh, you could be running the same PHP code if it was an HTML file, if you just had the, the tag for everything. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, index HTML and then I had the PHP tags and mm. then actually execute the code. Oh, yeah. I don't it, know if maybe that was just like a browser thing. Mm -mm. No, yeah. So just to clarify, you cannot embed PHP code in an HTML file. Right? At, if, all. at all. No. But you can use HTML code in a, in a PHP file. And if your PHP file doesn't contain any PHP syntax, then you can use it as an index.html. Right, so if once you start introducing the carrots, the only process that can understand what those carrots mean is PHP. So your normal in so if your page has any PHP in it, you just make the extension .php. That's correct. Yep. So your index page could be .php. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Um, and most uh, hosts that you use, be it DreamHost or GoDaddy, for example, will prioritize index.html then index.php, so they're going to... Mm, yeah, exactly. So they'll first load first of all. So actually, let's take a look at the planner.php because this is where we're actually going to be displaying all the movies before we actually do any, you know, uh, any, anything saving to the database. These are all going to be your movies. We need to display them somewhere. We could integrate PHP into here, right? We could say select all from uh, the database and then for each one of them, display them right here. But I'm going to do a little bit of a a trickery here, and I'm actually going to make an, make it an Ajax call. I'm going to say, Ajax, give me the data that is all in the movies, and display it back. Okay. So now we have another level of of abstraction where we need Ajax to be able to communicate to a PHP file that displays all our movies. So if that is a little confusing, still, let's take a look at movies.php because it's the most bare bones, simple imp uh, implementation of of um, what we want to do. Movies.php selects all the movies and displays them. And I think this is what you should see in your code as well when you take a look at it. Uh, no, no. Yeah, so um, actually your version should not have anything right here, but I've kind of given you the solution here. The goal is that you actually want to query the database using SQL. Exactly, you, so exactly the same syntax that I just did right now to display all of the stuff within MySQL, I'm doing within PHP. Does that sort of make sense? And so for every row, I'm going to display this sort of syntax right here, which is basically an, a, uh, a link surrounding an image. Mm -hmm. And if this doesn't seem sort of clear, we can actually see what movies.php contains. It should be pretty bare bones because there's no styling or CSS. Here it is. Actually, a question. There was yes. The nested quotes don't matter like that. Uh, uh, the line seven. Line seven. No. So the trickery here is that I've closed. Um, oh, which one? Like right line here. Line seven. Mm, that right there. Yep. Is that? Is it, that's not going to be a problem at all. Right here. Yeah. No. Um, the nicety. Yes. So the nice thing about it is this is pure HTML. This is pure PHP. So anything within the tags of PHP can be dealt with just by PHP alone. And so the, the, the key part here is that we're retrieving every single row from MySQL that we call dollar $row, and we're using a dictionary key approach to identify what data piece we want. So when you look back at describing, let's describe uh, movies. The two things that we have as fields here are the image 
and the title. Ideally, in a more complete data set, we would have movie name, when it was released, who was the directors, and stuff like that, right? But those two things are the keys for which we're actually retrieving the data here, right? So you, you look at title. What does title uh, represent as an HTML tag? Hmm? Mm, not quite. Mm. Uh, it's a little obscure, but if you hover over something and leave your mouse, that is what the title corresponds to. Now, I'm a big fan of accessibility, and accessibility is like considering the 10% or so of people who use the internet who don't have sight or hearing. And a lot of the considerations that people as web developers can easily, easily ignore is these little things like titles and IDs because no one gets to see them. No one really makes the effort to see the title necessarily uh, unless you're reading XKCD in which case you need to see the title. But um, it's always important to keep in, keep in mind that your audience may be pretty varied and in, in cases like this your title can describe what the image is which is really important. Actually the image alternative tag is probably better for it, but your link can also describe what the link goes to. Um, so that's cool. That's just movies.php. This is what Ajax is going to take and display in, into the main page. Right? So let's go back to... So we, is everyone clear with movies.php? This should be exactly what you have select all for movies. So, um, why is the href um, so this is sort of something I actually uh, was debating whether or not to include. The href always refers to something that it can the HTML reference, I guess, or HTTP reference, is going to try to bring you somewhere, right? So if you don't provide it, it's always going to try to bring you to to itself, right? So if you refer refresh yeah refresh this page, it's essentially going to try to reload the page and go back to yourself. Uh, is that the case? Mm, am I? Am I pulling the wrong shoe here? Um, mm, it should be, but I could be wrong. Um, you could leave it as blank. The consideration here is that we want to prevent it from doing anything other than uh, being a convenience factor so that when we click it, we can engage that click action. Um, so the JavaScript void is basically uh, overriding anything that it could po potentially do, like redirect you to the top part of the page or do other sort of funky things. Cool. So this is movies.php. Let's bring it into planner.php using Ajax. Right? So we want planner.php as it stands right now in lecture 6 planner.php. It should be pretty bare. Right? And this is what you should see. So in order to do that, we need to put in a few cool JavaScript things. And for the purposes of time, I'm actually going to copy and paste it from my instance so that you can take a look at it as well and, and copy and paste uh, as you see fit. Um, doo -doo -doo, yeah. So the magic that happens is pretty much uh, right here. So let's, let's decompose it in the sort of dustbin right here. Um, we have several functions going on here, three to be specific. One does search, so let's not care about that right now. We actually have four functions, don't we? One does clearing, so we'll deal with that uh, at a later point. Actually, let's not delete that, but we'll deal with that later. The first function I've called somewhat uh, conveniently as rebind. Um, and the reason here is that I want to be able to bind to every movie instance the click function. So that goes back to the reason why we want to actually do the JavaScript void. It's a little cl cl kludgy and we, we can actually get rid of it. But uh, the idea is that when you click on something, we want to do something, right? And that's where the jQuery instance is actually taken care of. Now, rebind as itself won't actually work, right? Because you have to call that function. You need to say call rebind before you can you can define as many functions as you want, but they won't have any effect on, unless you call them. Yes. The, exactly. Yep. I actually had one issue with, with callback stuff like mm -hmm. that, where I was trying to find a callback to what I think was actually a jQuery mobile element, which, which was like dot UI dash radio. Yep. But that isn't actually present in the, the HTML. That's not even present until actually jQuery does all of its magic on the actual page. 
page. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually, is there a way to assign a callback to something that's not actually there, like the moment that the page is first run? Depending on how jQuery mobile does things, you can actually do a document.ready, uh, which it okay. should actually uh, um, obey. So the I don't actually remember the exact syntax of it because the shortcut to it is actually really uh, a lot more. Um, oh boy, I've actually forgotten the the, the uh, shortcut. Um, mm -hmm, uh, the shortcut uh, is that ah yes? So this little piece of magic, and actually, if you want to do some research on it, look at document.ready. Essentially, what it says is do do not do anything that's encapsulated within this until everything has loaded. Okay. So until so if jQuery Mobile does obey that, it won't trigger any of the things that are within this until it has done all the magic that it requires it to uh, render everything pretty and, and make things those interactions. So it'll call that function at the end. Yes. Yeah. Then you're just like labeling it. You're not necessarily right. Exactly. So this one, this one is your. You, so put in magic here to do everything. Uh, anything you can put JavaScript. Yeah, you could do your. Um, but if you you can't just put a callback function necessarily. It has to be a callback to something else. So um, in in a sense, you could actually do exactly that right here. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Just shove, shove everything inside that. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Mm. Yeah. No, you'll def because this, this is once you have loaded those JavaScript files, okay. and that's the reason why you actually put it within the head tags um, initially as a, as a dependency, if you will, um, because uh, JavaScript is a fairly linear approach, and if you don't reference whatever you need to beforehand, none of these dollar signs mean anything without them. So instead of putting like if you wrote JavaScript but had it in Mm -hmm. It would be essentially the same as putting it inside this function. Should you put it in the head tag? Because, like, if you put the budget for the document, wouldn't like, you be mm -hmm. yet? So, for example, if you, if you try to access some part of the document, the problem doesn't come up yet. It's easy to do JavaScript and you're on the page that's inside it, so you just say, oh, like, you're asking for this form and the form doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So, that's why you're actually like, if you want to do something, Mm. So yeah, so to, to put things in a little more clearly, if you had something like this, um, and the ah uh, duh, <laughs> oh boy, JavaScript, and mm, src equals that, and then e, right, and your header tag. So this let's say magic happens between. You could do this, and you have another. You could do that within your head tag. Awesome. So uh, that being said, uh, the, re the real magic happens here, where we're basically making an AJAX call to movies.php. We're not sending any parameters, and we're having a callback function that dumps the, the response from that movies.php into an ID called results. So if that doesn't sort of make sense, let's, let's actually copy and paste that into planner.php. And I'm actually going to follow Pierre's suggestion to put everything. And so, what it may make sense a little more if we take a look at how things are happening in uh, in uh, the Firebug. So planner.php. Mm -hmm. And actually persisted things. Um, did I? Oh, I may have saved. Ah, I saved it in the wrong folder. 
So notice here that we're making a GET request here. And if you take a look at that GET request, it's exactly the same source and exactly the same content as what you had in uh, movies.php right here. Um, uh, do, do, do. Actually, more. Um, is it spare? Right, this was the raw data that we were doing the database query on. And, ooh, that's not good. Uh, I wonder why. But uh, there, there could be something else going on here that I'm un unaware of. Hmm. Or it could be Firebug. Ah, yes, probably Firebug said that there was too much coming back that it couldn't handle. Right, so you could actually limit that and say, um, how would you limit that? Here's a trivia question. Uh, no, not quite. It would still give you all 500. Uh, no, okay, actually, I'm going back to movies.php and I'm trying to limit the amount of stuff that comes back. You could do that. You could do that. Mm. Yep. <laughs> Any ideas? Limit. Limit. Limit from your start to your end. Yep. So I'm going to just retrieve 100 records. Or just to make things a little more vis visible, let's limit uh, row 0 to 10. You could do this from 10 to 100. 10 to, you know, you could change those parameters. Uh, but now you have 10. Uh, any order. And there's no prescribed order that is defined in MySQL, which is why it's gen. Hmm? You could, but the way the database is currently constructed, there's no way for it to actually understand. A, you could order it by title, or you could order it by name, or you could order it by date, for example. Right, there's a default within MySQL, and it dif differs between databases as well. So if you want to be very explicit about it, you could do order by, and you need to do it within any of the the parameters that you've given it in terms of columns. So you could do order by title, for example. right? And so just to bring this a little more concretely, because images can be a little confusing here, let's run the SQL query right here. And that may be a little small, so let's bring that up. Right, so I'm going to say order by title. And we also want to provide a direction. Like, do you want to order it alphabetically or you know, reverse alphabetically, or do you want to increase it in increasing number, for example? MySQL actually does have some pretty nice ordering uh, uh, normalities in which if you have a number field, it will order it uh, according to number. If you order it, uh, if it's a text field, it will order it alphabetically. So what would be... No, we have to define it here. So the Default also, I don't know if you can make an assumption about which direction it's going to be. We can try. Let's see if we order by title. Mm, it seems to be alphabetic by default here. I don't know if I would make that assumption, but I could be wrong. It could always be the case. Uh, if you wanted to change that, you could do order by title descending, in which case your Z's would come first. Awesome. Okay, so... Um, so that being said, if we refresh, now we would see uh, 10 titles, right? And since we're doing, did I did I actually put ordering? Oh, yes, I did. Order by title. Um, it's putting to 24s, first of all. Cool. So that's one part. Uh, we may need to speed things up. So I'm going to put in the other things that we need to take care of in planner.php, namely that we're going to do a, a type of, re the, you remember that rebind function that I mentioned? That is important because every time we make a, a search query we actually get back fresh data and if we didn't rebind all of the JavaScript bindings to the initial data would disappear and so to make that actually sort of clear let's actually um, let me uh, paste in the I think do I have all the data code pasted in nope um, let me paste it in from my instance right here so so the, the sort of key points to take out from here is that we have a search function right here. Uh, basically what it's saying is when you key up basically is a method from jQuery saying what happens when you, when you lift your hand off the key. There's key down as well, there's a key press approach. 
this is something that you might want to press uh, test out to see what is the most fluid interaction because if you do key press for example everything will be triggered when you press the key downwards but that means also that things might not be updated because you might type a letter and not have uh, it propagate to the database uh, correctly um, so we can actually play around with that a little bit uh, so let's take a look at planner you should have um, this basically let's do this and so what we would do when we search is we're going to actually provide it some conditions right we're going to say can we want to search something based on what we type into the input box at the very top right so if I were to type something here and I don't know why it's not triggering mm, ah, if I were to type something I want to make sure that whatever I'm typing gets sent all the way to the database the database comes back with some data that reflects the fact that I typed test right so when we're doing that we're actually sending along some data now in the previous spot we were actually not sending data now in a right in a real sort of ideal system, this would actually be post. And do you know why? So that you could use the URL and like try to try again, like recreate the URL. Mm, the not quite. That would actually be reflective of a get as opposed to a post. You don't want to expose the query in the URL. That could be a one approach. Um, one is the the thing I was trying to get to was a little more philosophical. The names behind get and post are because you either want to get data or you want to want to save or post data to the database. There's a variety of things, and if you're familiar with Ruby on Rails, for example, there are other syntaxes that you can get, like delete and update, which are um, basically sort of semantic approaches to saying what you're doing. Right. So in this case, I'm not necessarily getting data. Perhaps I am, so it wouldn't be too bad. But if I were actually saving data, you would actually want to change this to a post, just for sort of on a philosophical level. One of the things that we notice here is that we're passing in a parameter called conditions. What does this uh, signify right here? Uh, only retrieve things from the database that are specified by what you type. Okay, so yeah, essentially, so this is a actually special a syntax that defines the element that you are actually using uh, or referring to. So in this case, this is exactly the same as dot search, right? And so is search a class? Yes, it is. So it's it's just telling the back end where it came from. Yeah. Thing? Well, it's not even going back to the back end. It's saying this is what I'm going to package to send. So um, let's actually see what how that actually plays out. Do, do, do. So me, 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 me. let me clear everything. And if I oh, it's saying that rebind is not defined. Ah, so we don't have rebind set yet, and I'm just going to explain why that is actually clear important. So if I uh, type in a, so notice I'm doing key press right now. When I typed in A right here, the, the, set, the thing that got sent to the database is actually not A, which is why key press is not your ideal approach. And it takes a little bit of head wrapping to get to understand that when I type in another character, now A gets sent. See, so if I, it's always one character behind, right? And it's actually really interesting when you take a look at it. So let's see what happens when you do key down. I think key down should be the same as key press, so key up which is what I had initially, um, F, so this is more reflective, right? So right now we're sending, and like you said, you can actually see what's being sent right now because it's a get request. We're sending something to movies.php with parameters conditions, right? So let's go back to movies.php and parse that so that we can actually organize this to return exactly what we want, right? Because if we were to say, uh, select all from movies where title is like, um, Zorro, for example, this would be a valid query, right? It would go to the database and give me all the queries, uh, all the rows that have Zorro. If that doesn't seem particularly clear, let's actually run that. Um, and I'm going to do Zorro Season 4 as an example. Uh, Zorro Season 4. Ah, it didn't come back with anything. That's probably because I'm missing uh, a semicolon. 
The cool thing about SQL is that you can also provide it uh, things that are known as likes, right? So you can you might have seen this before. You can put little print, uh, percentage signs that define that you want it to be something similar to it and similar either before. So this means anything that precedes it could be something else, but as long as it has zero after it, that's good. Yep. Is that like a regular expression? Pretty much, yeah. Um, SQL. Pattern after like lower leg X or? Um, that's a good point. I don't know. I think uh, you don't have the full power of regex. Okay. In my but just seat. because, like, but just in this case, we can use percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I could be wrong, but um, so basically, what I'm doing here is that I'm saying anything that has zero in it, give me, give it back to me, right? So when you look at the database, it actually said there's absolutely nothing that has zero. That's because I said equals. It's actually supposed to be like. And it'll give me back everything. So you use like whatever you're using for the, the uh, parentheses. You always use like uh, percentages. Yep. Yeah. Yes, okay. exactly. And so just to make the point a little more clear, if we did something like season, and we did parentheses uh, percentages after that, it wouldn't. It, yeah. It would only search for things that have that start with season. Right. Do we have anything that starts with season? Uh, nope. But if we did the same query, and I apologize, I'm skipping around on Windows. If we did percentages on this, it should come back with Zorro season and all sorts of other things. So we're going to harness that basically by saying, when we do our query in movies.php, we want to make sure that the title appears to be something that the user has passed in, which we do using percentages like that. But now we need to pass in whatever's been sent along using uh, Ajax. So how do we do that? Yep. That's true. That is actually a good point. Yes. I was gonna say that. Yeah, request works. Uh, so we could. Say get, but not yeah. Um, get might be a little more explicit. I could be. Uh, I think you're right. And if you are familiar with request, I'd go with that. Uh, it might be a lot, a lot more generic, which might be interesting. But uh, I'm just going to do get for now. Uh, yeah, exactly. And this is inc uh, incorrect because if we took a look at what we were passing along, it's called conditions. So it's a little idiot. Uh, that's correct. Yep. Awesome. And so basically what it'll do is as long as conditions is set. Now here's a little bit of a problem. We're actually assuming that conditions is set right here right so the problem is that now if we don't have anything nothing will come back huh? actually it does hmm? uh, yes that's correct um, so what what's fortuitous here is that we're actually um, if we do if we provide nothing at all so if we did a SQL query where title uh, like um, percent percent it will actually match everything Right? Should. Yeah, it, ra it matches everything. But it's a little less than I ideal. Um, because we're running out of a little bit of time, I'm actually going to leave it as an exercise. Uh, but you can actually define whether or not uh, get conditions is set. You know, are you passing in anything at all? Right? In which case, you wouldn't actually want to go through the effort of building a like query because you're just displaying everything. But for now, it should work. And so if we run this, do do do. And. <laughs> Do, do, do. Yeah. Ah, okay. Back to Chrome we go. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with the code there, but um, we could be. Uh, I could be have have embedded some extra stuff. So I do so, and we've got things coming. Up. So da -da, treasure. Yeah. So there you have the the power of of um, SQL. SQL and AJAX and and everything there. Why are you um, um, abstracting it to two PHP files, mm -hmm. the movies and uh, planner? Um, basically, the because essentially what's happening is that you're making the same exact query initially as you are when you're doing a search, right? 
you're going back to the database and saying, give me all the movies, first of all. And then you're saying, going back to the movies, actually, all the movies with this particular title. So if you abstract it with PHP, it, it, with, with yeah, is the, the initial approach that, that's really interesting right there is I actually had all the, the, the movies display first of all here. I was doing a, you, I was basically embedding this right into here, you know. But once you realize that you're actually making the same query, then it just is a matter of adding an extra condition that then you can be more intelligent about just by, you know, making a subquery. Um, so this will work. Initially, it'll show up all the results, but the uh, it's better to it. That was my approach. So just moving quickly right along, one of the things that we need to now take care of is actually uh, putting in the um, the click event. So if um, if we take a look at the Google Doc, it should be actually here. Um, ah, uh, doo -doo. is it? Uh, yes. So let me just put this as an example right here where if we were to bind this initially to just the first instance, right? For every movie, when you click, you post it to save. You pass in the parameter of what this image is. And we do some callback. This is just doing it for the first instance, right? Not after you do the search. Once you start doing the search, so let, let me just put the, sort of make this a little more concrete. If I click on something, actually, we could do Let's do something a little more click, uh, clearer here. If uh, Let's do an alert. If I click on a movie, it alerts. In Firefox, it won't show anything. In Chrome, it'll show undefined, uh, like a little blank thing. So it works, right? But if I were to start searching right now, and I click on something, it wouldn't work, right? Because I've lost. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I've, you're, you need to, I've come back with a fresh data set from movies.php that has lost all the, the functionality of the JavaScript that we initially gave it. Right? So we need to then provide exactly the same movie.click uh, uh, convenience, which if we were to copy and paste right here would work as well, right? But it's, it's a little more efficient to actually uh, extract that as a, a separate function. Does that make sense? So right now it will, it will work. Um, uh, it should work. Uh, let's see, what am I screwing things up here? Um, if you come across an issue like this, Chrome will tell you if there are issues in your syntax. Um, and there shouldn't be a sin error. Mm, let's see why that is the case. Uh, oh, weird. Okay, uh, so if I were to do a search right now, it would still work. Right? Because I've copied and pasted the same exact code from here, but basically I'm just saying let's just do that as one function. And do, since we're doing the exact same thing, let's rebind. Ah, good point. Though not necessary, not not, not completely necessary, but a very good syntax to have. So so let's. Um, and I've, I'm afraid I may have to skip out on the uh, the um, the chart. Hope that wasn't too disastrous for people. But uh, what's useful here to consider is that we're actually making a call to save.php, just kind of like movies.php, right? We're passing in a parameter that has image. In this case, I'm doing a post just for the heck of it. There's not much of a reason to do a post, right? But what we're doing now is we're actually, when you take a look at save.php, save.php, instead of just displaying data, is now saving it to the database. So if you take a look, uh, at the details of save.php. It has absolutely nothing in it. And one the, the key point here is the goal of what we want to do is we want to save. And the syntax for that, actually let's take a look at what I have, is basically the same sort of SQL query except we're doing um, a uh, insert. right? So whereas we were doing select, we're inserting into flicked. A particular um, value pair right here. Um, so if we do that, and this post corresponds to the image URL, right? So you must be pretty com comfortable with that. And if we take a look at the database, this really usually helps me um, when I'm doing things because it gives you a check. I'm going to delete everything. There's absolutely nothing right there. But if we refresh this page, and hopefully, uh, ah, 
Firefox does have something it's hanging on, so I'll have to check about that. But if I do this and I hit a single one, there's no uh, response, which is a violation of a heuristic. Uh, but if you take a look at the data, it should show... Ah, oops, something did not come back. Mm -hmm. Let's see why that is. Uh, did I save it to the right folder? Yeah, save that PHP. Ah, the reason probably is because when we take a look at Planner, we are posting to save that PHP. Hmm. And we are rebinding. Uh, let's make sure that we're actually. Do the flick color something? Nope, that's actually the retrieval of the database uh, on the other end. Let's make sure that it was actually. Um, Let's see, I wonder why that is. Um. <laughs> That's a bit tragic. So that if that does happen, let's um, actually... Oh, this is painful. <laughs> no, I do not want an update. Let's take a look at what's happening. So if we click on something, oops, wonder why it's saving. It looks like it tried to save things first. Um, I'm not particularly sure why. Let's click it, and it should save. What it's sending along is the image, and the response is basically uh, there's absolutely nothing in there. Chances are I actually saved saved.php in the wrong thing. Mm. Ah, I know why. We didn't create a table called flicked. And um, that's the problem here when you're dealing with multiple databases. So let's quickly create that in the last couple minutes. The way you can export from a, an existing database is basically creating, um, if you run the export function, it will give you everything that I created in like movies.sql. Basically, I'm creating a fun table that has um, this basically, right? So if we take a look at... Um, .org, mysql.cs147.org mm. <laughs> yeah. um, re Remember I had actually changed the configuration to be the separate database um, So I have the movies database here, but I don't have flick so it has, no, it has no way to save it So let's run the operation of copying like just creating the table Doo -doo -doo -doo. We run it. We now have a flick table. It has no data, but now that if we were to click on something, it should come back into that into that database, and it does. And uh, if I can take five minutes more of your time, what's happening now that we can sort of uh, rampantly save stuff to the database? It's a fairly trivial manner to retrieve that data from the database in exactly the same way we've done it with the initial Ajax call, but using basically a timeout function that calls that requests data every so often. So would this be a strategy like, like really big websites like Google and Facebook that track clicks across yeah. their screen? Is mm -hmm. that how they do it? Um, or is there a, is that there are more approaches that they, uh, that can be done, um, but it, the general, insofar as the movie clicking and saving to the database, yeah. it's exactly how they're doing it. Okay. Yeah. So whenever you click, it depends on how they, usually they do have a JavaScript file that, that does that at the very end of the files, um, but you should, you should be able to monitor your, your, the activity using Firebug, Firebug and be able to click and see what's happening. Right, so you would also be able to tell if that was the case. Yeah, exactly. Cool, so um, just, just quickly to, to wrap up, I'm going to display what's going to happen on the index side. The index side is actually going to be um, uh, right, displaying uh, or retrieving information from the database. And we do exactly the same sort of jQuery call, where we're calling a function, call, uh, calling a PHP file called flick.php. If we take a look at flick.php in a bit, you'll see that all it's doing is exactly the same thing as um, as uh, it, well, the idea is that you select all from Flicked, right? Say, give me all the stuff that you have in the database called Flicked. And index.php is doing a get function, get call to that particular uh, web page 
displaying it in the ID called flicked, and repeating that every second. So it's a little inefficient here, right? It, okay, sure. Yeah. So the the index.php is creating. Um, say so if we put this right here, index.php is making a call uh, to flicked.php, and what flicked.php is basically containing is select all from flicked. So we should basically have the round trip uh, done. Let's let's give it a whirl and let's hope that it actually does work. So we have our planner on one side and we have our index.php on another. Index.php should display both all the movies that are currently in Flicked right now, right? And if we were to extract this and actually run this on a separate thing, or I'm going to pull this tab out so that it has a little more dramatic effect. If we did something like uh, Star Trek, and if I click on something, it comes up. Okay, um, that's all I have. Um, I have two pieces of candy left, so if people want to share it, uh, by all means. Or if anyone has a hankering for Haribo or Ritter, these are really cool. Could you just go back to the, the page that auto-refreshes on the index and just, yep. and just walk through that code? Sure. So yeah, this was a bit rushed. Um, but basically what we're doing here, so the, the neat function that, that is doing all the, the brunt work here is a thing called set timeout. And set timeout says, I want to run this particular function after a certain amount of time in milliseconds. Just yes. So right here, I'm making the first call to it, saying run time fact the time count after a thousand seconds, or a thousand milliseconds, and once I get to that time count, I'm going to say run me again in a thousand milliseconds. So yeah, that that's all there is to it. Um, and you can actually observe that function that behavior in Firebug, um, as you have seen before with the chat script as well. Uh, you'll see that it's basically calling itself uh, every every second. So, um, if you're interested in this sort of synchronicity across multiple devices, I would definitely suggest looking at a thing a technology called WebSockets. WebSockets is basically the way Facebook makes it and Twitter makes it so that you, when you're on the page and you have done absolutely nothing, suddenly you see like six new stories, or Twitter will say three new tweets they're not doing this particular approach because imagine if you had 90,000 people, a million people doing the same sort of thing, you'd be hammering the database a million times a second. And it's certainly less than efficient. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about too. Mm. What if you have a huge database? Like mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, all access to database. Right, exactly. So the nice thing about WebSockets is if you think of your phone as, as uh, the receiving end of a browser, WebSockets is basically a mechanism that pushes notifications to your device. Your device isn't always going to retrieve and say, "Give me new data," or else you drain, you know, you drain your battery life in a matter of minutes. But if you can push that data, um, then you can actually take advantage of only being able to like send data um, when you need to, which is really neat. It does require a little more overhead, like uh, actually develop it, creating your own web server, um, so that you can actually manage the interactions and, and transactions that happen. But there are frameworks out there that really make it simple. So if you want to try it out, it's a, it's pretty simple. Okay. <laughs>